County. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming uh, to support Ray tonight. Um, my name is Todd Sanders. I'm a defense attorney and have been for the last 20 years or so. Um, prior to that, I had the pleasure of working with Ray and I have the honor of introducing him tonight. Um, I practice in all of the jurisdictions in Northern Virginia. And I get asked, weekly at least, where do you like to practice the most? And as a defense attorney, I always say Fairfax. Because Fairfax is the one jurisdiction that no matter what, from top to bottom, as a defense attorney, you know you're gonna get a fair trial and fair treatment from the Commonwealth Attorney's Office. Ray has been that way since the first day I met him. He's an incredible litigator. He is the best attorney that I've ever seen, and I think people in this room who are lawyers would agree with me. He's an amazing attorney, uh, but he's ex also extremely fair. And um, when you have the chance to work with him as I did and see what happens inside an office, you realize it's not just prosecuting criminal cases, or at least trying to get convictions. Um, There's so many things that he has to review and see and make decisions, and it's always the right decision that he would make. And there are many decisions the public doesn't see. Decisions not to prosecute or to not authorize a search warrant. Or if someone was treated unfairly, when someone presents something to him, he will step up and say, that's not the right thing to do. He always does the right thing. I've never seen him one time not do that. In addition, uh, he told all of us as assistants, and we see it as defense attorneys because we're the benefit of it and our clients are the benefit of it. Um, he doesn't just seek convictions, he seeks justice. Uh, an example of that is really in the first offender program that, let, that the Fairfax has for shoplifters. They've had it for years and Ray has supported it wholeheartedly. It costs me a lot of money every year, I can tell you that, because Fairfax is the only jurisdiction in Northern Virginia that has that has this. If you were a first offender and you been caught shoplifting, young person, old person, an impulsive act, you don't need a lawyer. You can go to the court and the Commonwealth Attorney has to approve this. It's not by the legislature. Where they will agree, if you go to court, there's a program where you can be put on probation for a year, do some things, and the charge will be dismissed. And I have many clients come to my office, and they tell me it's Fairfax, and I say, well, you don't need me. Another county, I say, write me a check. <laughs> anyway, it's, uh, Fairfax needs Ray Morrow. Uh, he's a uh, fair prosecutor. He's tough. He knows who the bad guys are. But he also knows there are a lot of people who need a break. And he knows the difference. And I hope everyone here supports him this year and gets your friends out to vote. It's a very important election. Without further ado, Ray Mora. Thank you, folks. Can you hear me back there? Yeah. yeah. Well, first of all, uh, I'm so touched, really overwhelmed by the showing of all of my wonderful friends. Uh, I can't tell you uh, how humbled I am uh, to be standing here in front of so many wonderful people, um, just friends from all around the county, police officers, probation officers, uh, friends and neighbors, some of the finest lawyers I've ever seen. Uh, contrary to what Todd said, I'm not the best lawyer, but uh, I work pretty hard on it, I'll tell you that. But uh, I um, can't hear you. Oh, oh, sorry. Pull it down. Pull it down. I know. <laughs> a little slimmer too. <laughs> no. Uh, okay. Here. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. I'll talk a little louder. I also want to thank all uh, of my assistants who are here, past and present. Uh, you mean so much to me. Uh, I'm at the point now. I'm over 60, so I'm starting to meet assistants' parents, and uh, it's, it's one of my favorite things to do. Uh, I have the greatest office uh, anyone could want. These are the finest, hardest working people. They're in there six, seven days a week. And uh, the only thing I tell them is we're here to do the right thing. 
and they take that mission and they run with it, and they're also incredibly talented uh, lawyers. Um, it's hard to believe that December 27th was my 35th anniversary as a prosecutor. Um, I started out in 1983, I thought I'd serve a couple years uh, as a prosecutor and then get into a firm with some friends and maybe get into personal injury or something. Uh, but um, as my wife will tell you, I turned away from the money and uh, stayed in the office. I, I just fell in love with it. One of my first assignments once I proved myself in the courtroom was handling child sex cases. And I can remember going out to the homes of child victims and sitting on the, the floor of their family room on a Saturday and coloring with them for a couple of hours, never mentioning the case or what happened to them. And then going back the next weekend or maybe to a soccer game and start to talk to them. And then when they felt comfortable with me, I would get them to open up and I would try those cases. And they're hard cases. You don't win all of them. You lose a lot of them. But I was so happy to be entrusted with someone's child and to fight for them uh, so hard. So I got addicted to it then. Um, and I've never lost that passion for prosecution and really for justice especially for the weak and those who are preyed upon. But you know, I go around uh, to these uh, functions and a lot of people who know me, I, I will confess I'm a better prosecutor than I am a politician, but um, I go to a lot of uh, functions and people are kind enough to let me speak. And recently a, a, a gentleman introduced me as uh, Ray Morrow, the prosecutor. He's the guy who puts people in jail. And um, it was very, a very nice gentleman, and I know he meant well, but I, I have to tell you, I've never thought that putting people in jail was a central part of what I do as a prosecutor. Um, I tell all my new assistants that our job is to do the right thing in every case for the right reasons. We don't count convictions. We don't keep notches on our gun belt. Sometimes doing the right thing means not charging a case, which can be very controversial which you can't charge a case if you don't think you can prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. I don't charge cases that I can't prove and lay it off on the judge to take the heat. I do the right thing, and all my assistants do the right thing. We don't charge it. Sometimes doing the right thing could mean diverting someone from uh, the criminal justice system. Um, I've been at it a long time, but I've kept up with the literature, just like a doctor would or uh, a scientist. You need to keep current. So I keep up with uh, the new latest studies and um, the evidence-based uh, studies that help prosecutors do a better job to make a healthy community. So I follow all that, and I'll talk about some of that in a minute. Sometimes doing the right thing means taking on a very difficult case. Like when I went down to Chesapeake, Virginia, and lived in a hotel with my hero Bob Moran for three months while we tried uh, the DC snipers. Or it could mean, um, asking a jury to sentence someone to a lengthy sentence for raping a woman or murdering somebody. It's a hard thing to do. It's not a joyful thing to do, but it is a necessary part of the job to keep people safe. So it's a job about balancing. And the prosecutor is in a unique position because my job is not just to represent the public and the victim when the victim is in the right, but it's also to represent the defendant in the sense that I am entrusted or um, it's my duty to make sure the defendant gets a fair trial and I take that very seriously and I'm so proud tonight that so many defense attorneys are in this room and support me some of whom I didn't even meet until tonight but they told me they they love working with my office because the assistants are fair and we try to do the right thing yes we fight we're opponents in the courtroom but we're not enemies and that's an important distinction so my job thank you Everyone knows, I think, in this room that Fairfax County is one of the safest jurisdictions in the nation for its size. Our crime rate, rate is low. I think that's due to a lot of, lot of different uh, factors, very educated uh, community, terrific police departments uh, all across the county, um, and, and, and just wonderful citizens. And so it is a key part of my job to continue that record of safety and to keep the public safe as, as actually the chief law enforcement officer. I take an oath to support the Constitution 
and the statutes of the Commonwealth of Virginia. But there are other ways to protect public safety. Some might not come to mind immediately, but if you're in the system, you'd understand. Sometimes you can protect the community better by keeping someone out of jail or prison who doesn't belong there. And that's why I've kept up with the data and the studies, and I've used every progressive program that I can get behind to help make our community healthier. For instance, we have a veterans court. Many veterans in this room tonight. Let's give them all a round of applause. God bless each and every one of you men and women who are veterans. I wasn't a veteran. My dad uh, is buried in Arlington. He was a Navy captain. Um, obviously, I loved my dad more than anybody in the world. Um, taught me so much. That's helped me through these days. But I was taught what wearing a uniform means and the sacrifices that these folks make for us. So we have a veterans court. And those who have served us so well and so selflessly when they fall upon hard times, when they have PTSD, they have drug and alcohol problems, they are homeless. We have a program, it is just an amazing program. Our public defender is involved, Don Buderak does a great job. Um, my staff, uh, Katie Pavlicek here is the, is the leader of it. We meet with defense attorneys, social workers, veteran peers, and judges, and we work on each individual case to try to get that man or woman out of the system and back to leading a successful and happy life. Very proud of that program. Thank you. I think every, everybody's aware of the opioid crisis. Uh, I get all the autopsies in the county every week. I have to go through them, and it is mind-numbingly sad. It breaks my heart, the number of opioid and uh, fentanyl, a lot of fentanyl deaths that we have. So what do we do? We establish a drug court. It took us a year to get it. We had to send people to trainings all over the country. Supreme Court approved that we have a drug court. This drug court is aimed to keep people who would otherwise be in jail out of jail. Repeat offenders, people who just, you know, because of the pernicious nature of drugs, they just can't get off it. Uh, so we work with them to try to keep them out of jail because we know we can't arrest our way out of this drug problem. It's a medical problem. People need help. And I'd rather keep someone out of jail than put them in jail if they're not hurting other people or a risk to the public. <laughs> Many of my close friends in this room probably know that uh, my mom, bless her heart, had uh, severe mental uh, illness when I was a child. She was um, institutionalized on and off uh, through my young life. Um, she uh, now has dementia. She's um, in a facility, but loved my mother dearly, and that was another thing in my life uh, that just touched me, to see my mom suffer as she did. Um, I just wanted to, you know, make sure that in my life I reached out and helped people, um, and especially people suffering from mental health problems. So we have a mental health docket. Uh, Casey Lingen, my chief deputy, who is just the greatest you could ever ask for in a lawyer and a man, uh, he heads that up for me. And we're working hard to get people off the street who are involved in repeated crimes, shoplifting, disorderly conduct, minor assaults, and other things. We're trying to get them out of jail where they don't belong. Mentally ill people don't belong in jail. They belong in hospitals. They belong getting treatment from psychologists and, and social workers. And we're trying to make that happen. And it's my hope that by next year, it's going to be a full-blown blown mental health court. And we're going to get some extra funding for it. But it's working well. We work with the Community Service Board, um, law enforcement. Our police department is tremendous. The men and women on the street, they try to divert mentally ill people don't, by not even bringing them to the courthouse or the jail and getting them right to the mental health center in Merrifield. It's, 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 it's really a wonderful program. We have other programs. Supervised release, cash bail is a big issue. You probably read about it in the papers. Um, I'm not a big fan of cash bail. I've never asked for a cash bail in my life in Fairfax. Every, every jurisdiction does it a little differently. In our jurisdiction, the magistrate set the bond, the judge reviews it. I can't increase it or reduce it myself, but we don't ask for them. And I've uh, told my assistants, if the judge sets a cash bond, somebody can't make it and they're not, uh, make the number, and you don't think they're a danger to the community uh, or a, 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 a real risk not to appear, 
give, ask the judge to reduce it. It's up to the judge, but we'll ask to reduce it. Um, one of the problems with not having any way to bring people back to court is this. Um, the violent people, it's obvious. You want them, if they're rapists and murderers, you, you want to hold them for community safety. But let's say you have somebody who's bilking the elderly, and $37 billion a year is built from the elderly in this country. Happens all the time in this county. Tree people come out and tell the, the little old man it'll be $700 and they make it into $17,000 check, that kind of thing. Those people don't appear in court if they're out without, without any kind of restraint on them. And the old people can't keep coming back to court. They're old, it's hard to come once, much less two, three times. Same thing with uh, mostly immigrants. They are working uh, sort of low jobs, low paying jobs. And, they, and they're a lot of our victims. They get victimized a lot um, by gangs and, and all sorts of extortion plots that you know, take advantage of their innocence as, as newcomers to this country. Um, that's a real problem for them to show up to court. Once, they can make it. Twice, they're not getting paid. Three times, you won't see them. So we have to work harder, and we are working with diversion, uh, excuse me, uh, the SRP supervised release to make it uh, user friendly, where the people can call in, the defendants can call in, probation officers can contact them, and that saves you, the taxpayers, money as well, because it's $190 a day to house somebody. And I, and I believe firmly in the presumption of innocence as well, so we have to remember that in that calculation. We also have a shadow of prosecutor program where we um, primarily recruit from uh, underrepresented communities, high schools with high minority populations. Uh, we'll take anyone into it, but I'm proud to say that one of the graduates of that program is now in Catholic University Law School and called me this afternoon to say he wanted to be here so badly to talk about the program and what it's meant to him. Um, and if I win, he's going to work for me. <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll move it along a little bit. Juvenile court, a lot of people talk about the um, uh, school to prison pipeline. That's of concern. There have been a lot of studies uh, of Annie Casey Foundation and many others that it's not necessarily a good thing to lock a, a child up who did something that's you know not a murder or something. Um, it can stigmatize them and result in more uh, recidivism on that person's part. So I'm proud to say we've worked very closely with Bob Birmingham, who is the uh, head of our juvenile court and a terrific guy, uh, the defense bar, the courts, probation, uh, uh, on our system. And it is a model system. Our adult, excuse me, our juvenile jail population is at its lowest ever. The The juvenile detention center is built to house 125 kids. Typically, there's 20 in there, and they're mostly gang members and violent people. And it's not that we give up on the gang members and the violent people up to a point. We, there's another program over there where they assess these kids, they work with them, and we work with the courts by not entering into plea agreements up front that tie the hands of, of the people who can help these kids. We wait, we do studies, we try to help everyone we can. Some are not safe to go back on the streets. We just tried the case of uh, 10 gang members who murdered a 15-year-old. Um, it was a horrific thing. So, you know, there we try the cases and we ask for the appropriate sentences, but we do our best to help kids because after all, kids are worth saving and they're our future. I also want to say that I'm not late to the party on this criminal justice reform. I was uh, progressive back when progressive wasn't cool uh, in the mid-2000s. The first thing I did upon getting elected was to expand the discovery rule in Virginia. Some of you may know that the Supreme Court had a rule that basically said defense attorneys are entitled to very little discovery. No police reports, no witness statements. I thought that was wrong. I thought that was wrong because I'm not the kind of person who wants to wake up someday and find out an innocent man was in prison for 20 years because I failed to turn something over or miss something. So I turn it all over, although I do redact victims' personal information and those things because it's fair, it's the right thing to do. The Supreme Court has just delayed again changing that rule for another year. I did it the first day I got in and I'm proud of that.
some of you may not know, but the threshold level for a grand larceny, in other words, the amount of money that uh, constitutes a grand larceny if someone stole it would be $200. And it was like that for decades. Well, to me, that was just wrong. Uh, so I went down to Richmond um, at the request of my good friend Chap Peterson and testified 10 or 11 years ago that it should be raised. I wanted it raised to 1,000, but we were trying to get it passed, so we said, well, how about make it 750? Well, that was 10 years ago. They just made it $500 now. So um, I was way ahead of the curve. Why? Because it's fair. $200 in 1974 is not the same as $200 in, in 2007 or now. So those are the kind of things um, that I believe in. I don't want to, one of the things that sometimes is left out sometimes uh, in the, when people talk about criminal justice reform is the victims. And the thing about me is, I, you know, I've stepped over a lot, a lot of bodies of children. Um, I've seen a lot of uh, horrific crime scenes. And I've sat with a lot of crime families who lost their loved ones. I'll never forget the victims. I'll always fight hard for the victims. Um, MS-13, DC snipers, serial killer Alfredo Prieto, you might remember he came here, kidnapped a couple who were coming home from a Christmas party. Uh, Warren Fulton and Rachel Raver, two GW kids, about three miles from here, uh, carjacked them, murdered them both, and raped her as she lay dying. Yeah, I took that case on, and I went after them hard. And I think that was justice in that case. <laughs> Same, thing with, uh, thank you. Same thing with Jesse Matthew, uh, the UVA serial killer murdered Hannah, Hannah Graham. <clears throat> and, um, Morgan Harrington. Well, he also attacked a young lady here in Fairfax City. The case went cold for many years. Um, we never, we never forgot it. He he tried to kill her, um, and he sexually assaulted her. And he fled, and he got away with it for about ten years. Well, my chief deputy Casey Lingham was watching uh, the uh, television news, and he saw the, uh, uh, I guess, mugshot of the suspect who had killed Hannah Graham down at UVA came into my office, he said, Ray, doesn't that look like the uh, sketch from our case from 10 years ago? I said, sure does. So we, uh, the police down there went and got some cigarette butts out of uh, Mr. Uh, Matthews' garbage, did some DNA testing. We had some DNA, seminal fluid, and we were able to try that guy. And I went after him hard, and I'm, not, and I'm proud of it. I want to say, having talked about a few of those cases, um, the job of the prosecutor, this job that I'm so privileged to hold, is not a job for amateurs. It's no place for on-the-job training. The newest assistant in my office is more experienced than my opponent. The newest. So far, the information I have from people who worked with him is that he tried a couple of tax cases with the IRS as a victim. A couple of tax cases, one of which got reversed on appeal. I don't, I don't dishonor that, but this is serious business we're talking about. People don't get to choose their own prosecutor, except as an electorate. If your daughter was kidnapped, God forbid, or your mother, her life savings were stolen, would you want a guy who has 35 years of experience fighting in the courtroom and who has a staff of some of the finest lawyers in the state? Or do you want a guy who tried a few tax cases and says he's going to be out in the public more? I'm not out in the public more because I'm working six, seven days a week. So in the end, my job is not sending people to jail necessarily, it's a small part of it. My job is protect the community, make it a healthy community, protect you all from predators. But my job is also to believe in second chances. There's nothing inconsistent with compassion and prosecution. I have a big heart and I'll help anyone who needs help. But if you're hurting women and children in this county, I'm coming down hard on you.
close out now and thank you for bearing with me. Um, this is so important to me. I, it means the world to me, this job still, after all these years. But uh, one of my heroes is a, a former uh, Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, Robert Jackson. Uh, you, you might know he, he was uh, the Attorney General and Associate Justice on the Supreme Court, but he was also uh, the lead prosecutor on the Nuremberg trials in the wake of the Holocaust. And I'm just so impressed with this man. But way back in the 40s, he described the qualities uh, of a good prosecutor. And he said, the qualities of a good prosecutor are as elusive and as impossible to define as those which mark a gentleman, or gentlewoman, I might add these days, <laughs> and those who need to be told would not understand it anyway. A sensitivity to fair play and sportsmanship is perhaps the best protection against the abuse of power, and the citizen's safety lies in the prosecutor who, who tempers zeal with human kindness, who seeks truth and not victims, who serves the law and not factional purposes, and who approaches his task with humility. I ask that you please vote for me on June 11th. Please return me to the job I love so well. I promised to work as hard as I can to keep you safe and to help everyone in this county who needs help. Thank you so much.